magic word Here in the secret kindergarten The world's best show for kids is starting The secret kindergarten radio show Use your ears and your imagination We're going to play, we're having fun Hello and welcome back to The Secret Kindergarten and this show today has castles in it. It also has bluebirds in it. What do you think of when you think of castles and bluebirds? I don't know, but it paints a picture in my mind. What picture does it paint in your mind? Let's play some music. To market, to market, to buy a fat pig. Home again, home again, jiggity jig. To market, to market, to buy a sweet dog. Home again, home again, jiggity jog. To market, to market, to buy some eggs. Home again, home again, jiggity jigs. To market, to market, to buy some bread. Home again, home again, jiggity jet. To market, to market, to buy some apples. Home again, home again, jiggity chapels. To market, to market, to buy some bananas. Home again, home again, jiggity chanas. To market, to market, to buy some carrots. Home again, home again, jiggity chairs. To market, to market, to buy some potatoes. Home again, home again, jiggity jados. To market, to market, to buy some cake. Home again, home again, jiggity jake. To market, to market, to buy some pie. Home again, home again, jiggity chai. Now, if, if going to the market was that peaceful, wouldn't that be lovely? And maybe you go, maybe that person was going to the market in the castle. The bluebirds flying around makes me feel of peace, makes me feel safe, and I will stop blah blah blahing and we're going to play Clapping in the Castle. And this music's by Nancy Stewart from nancymusic.com. Definitely check that out. Her music is amazing. This is Clapping in the Castle. There is clapping in the castle, there is clapping all around. There is clapping in the castle, mirth and merriment abound. There is jumping with the jesters, there is jumping all around. There is jumping with the jesters, mirth and merriment abound. There is twirling in the towers, there is twirling all around. There is twirling in the towers, mirth and merriment abound. There is dancing on the drawbridge, there is dancing all around. There is dancing on the drawbridge, mirth and merriment abound. Light the candles, start the music, lords and ladies, one and all. With our song and dance and laughter, we will fill the castle walls. With our song and dance and laughter, we will fill the castle walls. Oh, 
happy days in the castle. Living in a castle. That must have been Once Upon a Time, which is the name of this next song. Once upon a time there was a princess who decided to fly to the moon. So she hopped into her shiny airplane and said, don't worry, I'll be home soon. Once upon a time there was a cowboy who decided to swim to the sea. So he hopped into his slimy sailboat. Once upon a time there was a librarian who decided to dance to the zoo. So she hopped into her tiny dump truck and said, I'd like to go with you. This next one's called Cows Are in the Castle. Beautiful songs, thanks to Nancy Stewart of nancymusic.com. And I want to take you back to a time where people did live in castles. Well, maybe people still do. But anyway, buckle up, settle yourself in. Or even better, I hope you're doing some cool activities with this music in the background, or you're going to a cool place in the car with mummy and daddy. This one is a long story. It's King Arthur. So let's get straight into it. King Arthur, adapted from stories from La Morte d'Arthur and the Mabinogan by Beatrice Clay. Long years ago, there ruled over Britain a king called Uther Pendragon. A mighty prince was he, and feared by all men. Yet, when he sought the love of the fair Igrin of Cornwall, she would have naught to do with him so that, from grief and disappointment, Uther fell sick, and at last seemed like to die. Now in those days there lived a famous magician named Merlin, so powerful that he could change his form at will, or even make himself invisible. Nor was there any place so remote, but that he could reach it at once, merely by wishing himself there. One day, suddenly, he stood at Uther's bedside and said, "'Sir King,' I know thy grief, and am ready to help thee. Only promise to give me at his birth the son that shall be born to thee, and thou shalt have thy heart's desire. To this the king agreed joyfully, and Merlin kept his word, for he gave Uther the form of one whom Igrin had loved dearly, and so she took him willingly for her husband. When the time had come that a child should be born to the king and queen, Merlin appeared before Uther to remind him of his promise, and Uther swore it should be as he had said. Three days later a prince was born, and, with pomp and ceremony, was christened by the name of Arthur. But immediately thereafter the king commanded that the child should be carried to the postern gate, there to be given to the old man, who would be found waiting without. Not long after Uther fell sick, and he knew that his end was come. So, by Merlin's advice, he called together his knights and barons, and said to them, My death draws near. I charge you, therefore, 
that ye obey my son even as ye have obeyed me, and my curse upon him if he claim not the crown when he is a man grown. Then the king turned his face to the wall and died. Scarcely was Uther laid in his grave before disputes arose. Few of the nobles had seen Arthur or even heard of him, and not one of them would have been willing to be ruled by a child. Rather, each thought himself fitted to be king, and, strengthening his own castle, made war on his neighbors until confusion alone was supreme, and the poor groaned because there was none to help them. Now, when Merlin carried away Arthur, for Merlin was the old man who had stood at the postern gate, he had known all that would happen, and had taken the child to keep him safe from the fierce barons until he should be of age to rule wisely and well, and perform all the wonders prophesied of him. He gave the child to the care of the good knight Sir Ector to bring up with his son Kay, but revealed not to him that it was the son of Uther Pendragon that was given into his charge. At last, when years had passed and Arthur was grown a tall youth, well skilled in knightly exercises, Merlin went to the Archbishop of Canterbury and advised him that he should call together at Christmas time all the chief men of the realm to the great cathedral in London. For, said Merlin, there shall be seen a great marvel by which it shall be made clear to all men who is the lawful king of this land. The archbishop did as Merlin counseled. Under pain of a fearful curse, he bade barons and knights come to London to keep the feast and to pray heaven to send peace to the realm. The people hastened to obey the archbishop's commands and from all sides, barons and knights came riding in to keep the birth feast of our Lord. And when they had prayed and were coming forth from the cathedral, they saw a strange sight. There, in the open space before the church, stood on a great stone an anvil thrust through with a sword, and on the stone were written these words, Whoso can draw forth this sword is rightful king of Britain born. At once there were fierce quarrels, each man clamoring to be the first to try his fortune, none doubting his own success. Then the archbishop decreed that each should make the venture in turn, from the greatest baron to the least knight, and each in turn, having put forth his utmost strength, failed to move the sword one inch, and drew back ashamed. So the archbishop dismissed the company, and having appointed guards to watch over the stone, sent messengers through all the land to give word of great jousts to be held in London at Easter, when each knight could give proof of his skill and courage, and try whether the adventure of the sword was for him. Among those who rode to London at Easter was the good Sir Ector, and with him his son Sir Kay, newly made a knight, and the young Arthur. When the morning came that the jousts should begin, Sir Kay and Arthur mounted their horses and set out for the lists, but before they reached the field, Kay looked and saw that he had left his sword behind. Immediately Arthur turned back to fetch it for him, only to find the house fast shut, for all were gone to view the tournament. Sore vexed was Arthur, fearing lest his brother Kay should lose his chance of gaining glory, till, of a sudden, he bethought him of the sword in the great anvil before the cathedral. Thither he rode with all speed, and the guards having deserted their post to view the tournament, there was none to forbid him the adventure. He leapt from his horse, seized the hilt, and instantly drew forth the sword as easily as from a scabbard. Then, mounting his horse and thinking no marvel of what he had done, he rode after his brother and handed him the weapon. When Kay looked at it, he saw at once that it was the wondrous sword from the stone. In great joy he sought his father, and showing it to him, said, Then must I be king of Britain? But Sir Ector bade him say how he came by the sword, and when Sir Kay told how Arthur had brought it to him, Sir Ector bent his knee to the boy and said, Sir, I perceive that ye are my king, and here I tender you my homage. And Kay did as his father. Then the three sought the archbishop, to whom they related all that had happened, and he, much marveling, called the people together to the great stone. 
and bade Arthur thrust back the sword and draw it forth again in the presence of all, which he did with ease. But an angry murmur arose from the barons, who cried that what a boy could do, a man could do. So, at the archbishop's word, the sword was put back, and each man, whether baron or knight, tried in his turn to draw it forth, and failed. Then, for the third time, Arthur drew forth the sword. Immediately there arose from the people a great shout, "'Arthur is king! Arthur is king! We will have no king but Arthur!' And though the great barons scowled and threatened, they fell on their knees before him, while the archbishop placed the crown upon his head, and swore to obey him faithfully as their lord and sovereign. Thus Arthur was made king, and to all he did justice, righting wrongs and giving to all their dues. Nor was he forgetful of those that had been his friends, for Kay, whom he loved as a brother, he made seneschal and chief of his household, and to Sir Ector, his foster father, he gave broad lands. Thus Arthur was made king, but he had to fight for his own, for eleven great kings drew together and refused to acknowledge him as their lord, and chief amongst the rebels was King Lot of Orknev, who had married Arthur's sister, Bellicent. By Merlin's advice, Arthur sent for help overseas, to Ban and Bors, the two great kings who ruled in Gaul. With their aid, he overthrew his foes in a great battle near the river Trent, and then he passed with them into their own lands, and helped them drive out their enemies. So there was ever great friendship between Arthur and the kings, Ban and Bors, and all their kindred, and afterwards some of the most famous knights of the round table were of that kin. Then King Arthur set himself to restore order throughout his kingdom. To all who would submit and amend their evil ways he showed kindness, but to those who persisted in oppression and wrong he removed, putting in their places others who would deal justly with the people. And because the land had become overrun with forests during the days of misrule, he cut roads through the thickets, that no longer wild beasts and men, fiercer than the beasts, should lurk in their gloom, to the harm of the weak and defenseless. Thus it came to pass that soon the peasant ploughed his fields in safety, and where had been wastes, men dwelt again in peace and prosperity. Among the lesser kings whom Arthur helped to rebuild their towns and restore order was King Leodegrance of Cameliard. Now Leodegrance had one fair child, his daughter Guinevere, and from the time that first he saw her, Arthur gave her all his love. So he sought counsel of Merlin, his chief adviser. Merlin heard the king sorrowfully, and he said, Sir king, when a man's heart is set, he may not change. Yet had it been well if ye had loved another. So the king sent his knights to Leodegrance to ask of him his daughter, and Leodegrance consented, rejoicing to wed her to so good and knightly a king. With great pomp the princess was conducted to Canterbury, and there the king met her. And the two were wed by the archbishop in the great cathedral, amid the rejoicings of the people. On that same day did Arthur found his order of the round table, the fame of which was to spread throughout Christendom, and endure through all time. Now the round table had been made for King Uther Pendragon by Merlin, who had meant thereby to set forth plainly to all men the roundness of the earth. After Uther died, King Leodegrance had possessed it. But when Arthur was wed, he sent it to him as a gift, and great was the king's joy at receiving it. One hundred and fifty knights might take their places about it, and for them Merlin made sieges or seats. One hundred and twenty-eight did Arthur knight at that great feast. Thereafter, if any sieges were empty, at the high festival of Pentecost, new knights were ordained to fill them, and by magic was the name of each knight found inscribed in letters of gold in his proper siege. One seat only long remained unoccupied, and that was the siege perilous. No knight might occupy it until the coming of Sir Galahad, for without danger to his life none might sit there who was not free from all stain of sin. With pomp and ceremony did each knight take upon him the vows of true knighthood, 
to obey the king, to show mercy to all who asked it, to defend the weak, and for no worldly gain to fight in a wrongful cause. And all the knights rejoiced together, doing honor to Arthur and to his queen. Then they rode forth to right the wrong and help the oppressed, and by their aid the king held his realm in peace, doing justice to all. Now as time passed, King Arthur gathered into his order of the round table knights whose peers shall never be found in any age, and foremost amongst them was Sir Launcelot du Lac. Such was his strength that none against whom he had laid lance in rest could keep the saddle, and no shield was proof against his sword dent. But for his courtesy even more than for his courage and strength, Sir Launcelot was famed far and near. Gentle he was, and ever the first to rejoice in the renown of another, and in the jousts he would avoid encounter with the young and untried knight, letting him pass to gain glory if he might. It would take a great book to record all the famous deeds of Sir Launcelot and all his adventures. He was of Gaul, for his father, King Ban, ruled over Benwick. He was named Lancelot du Lac by the Lady of the Lake, who reared him when his mother died. Early he won renown, then, when there was peace in his own land, he passed into Britain to Arthur's court, where the king received him gladly, and made him knight of the round table, and took him for his trustiest friend. And so it was that, when Guinevere was to be brought to Canterbury, to be married to the king, Lancelot was chief of the knights sent to wait upon her, and of this came the sorrow of later days. For from the moment he saw her, Sir Lancelot loved Guinevere, for her sake remaining wifeless all his days, and in all things being her faithful knight. But busybodies and mischief-makers spoke evil of Sir Lancelot and the queen, and from their talk came the undoing of the king and the downfall of his great work." But that was after long years, and after many true knights had lived their lives, honoring the king and queen, and doing great deeds. Before Merlin passed from the world of men, he had uttered many marvelous prophecies, and one that boded ill to King Arthur, for he foretold that, in the days to come, a son of Arthur's sister should stir up bitter war against the king, and at last a great battle should be fought, when many a brave knight should find his doom. Now among the nephews of Arthur was one most dishonorable. His name was Mordred. No knightly deed had he ever done, and he hated to hear the good report of others, because he himself was a coward and envious. But of all the round table there was none that Mordred hated more than Sir Launcelot du Lac, whom all true knights held in most honor, and not the less did Mordred hate Lancelot, that he was the knight whom Guinevere had in most esteem. So at last, his jealous rage passing all bounds, he spoke evil of the queen and of Lancelot, saying that they were traitors to the king. Now Sir Gawain and Sir Gareth, Mordred's brothers, refused to give ear to those slanders, holding that Sir Lancelot, in his knightly service of the queen, did honor to King Arthur also. But by ill fortune another brother, Sir Agravain, did ill will to the queen, and professed to believe Mordred's evil tales. So the two went to King Arthur with their ill stories. Now when Arthur had heard them he was wroth, for never would he lightly believe evil of any, and Sir Launcelot was the knight whom he loved above all others. Sternly then he bade them be gone, and come no more to him with unproven tales against any and least of all against Sir Launcelot and their lady, the queen. The two departed, but in their hearts was hatred against Launcelot and the queen, more bitter than ever for the rebuke they had called down upon themselves. Great was the king's grief. Despite all that Mordred could say, he was slow to doubt Sir Launcelot, whom he loved. But his mind was filled with forebodings, and well he knew that their kin would seek vengeance on Sir Launcelot, and the noble fellowship of the round table be utterly destroyed. All too soon it proved even as the king had feared. Many were found to hold with Sir Mordred, some from envy of the honor and worship of the noble Sir Launcelot, and among them even were those who dared to raise their voice against the queen herself, 
calling for judgment upon her, as leagued with a traitor against the king, and as having caused the death of so many good knights. Now in those days the law was that if any one were accused of treason by witnesses, or taken in the act, that one should die the death by burning, be it man or woman, knight or churl. So then the rumors grew to a loud clamor, that the law should have its course, and that King Arthur should pass sentence on the queen. Then was the king's woe doubled. For, said he, I sit as king to be a rightful judge, and keep all the law. Wherefore I may not do battle for my own queen, and now there is none other to help her. So a decree was issued that Queen Guinevere should be burnt at the stake outside the walls of Carlisle. Forthwith King Arthur sent for his nephew, Sir Gawain, and said to him, Fair nephew, I give it in charge to you to see that all is done as has been decreed. But Sir Gawain answered boldly, Sir King, never will I be present to see my lady the queen die. It is of ill counsel that ye have consented to her death. Then the king bade Gawain send his two young brothers, Sir Gareth and Sir Gaheris, to receive his commands, and these he desired to attend the queen to the place of execution. So Gareth made answer for both. My lord the king, we owe you obedience in all things, but know that it is sore against our wills that we obey you in this, nor will we appear in arms in the place where that noble lady shall die." Then sorrowfully they mounted their horses and rode to Carlisle. When the day appointed had come, the queen was led forth to a place without the walls of Carlisle, and there she was bound to the stake to be burnt to death. Loud were her ladies' lamentations, and many a lord was found to weep at that grievous sight of a queen brought so low. Yet was there none who dared come forward as her champion, lest he should be suspected of treason. As for Gareth and Gaheris, they could not bear the sight, and stood with their faces covered in their mantles. Then, just as the torch was to be applied to the faggots, there was a sound as of many horses galloping, and the next instant a band of knights rushed upon the astonished throng, their leader cutting down all who crossed his path, until he reached the queen, whom he lifted to his saddle and bore from the press. Then all men knew that it was Sir Lancelot, come nightly to rescue the queen, and in their hearts they rejoiced. So with little hindrance they rode away, Sir Lancelot and all his kin with the queen in their midst, till they came to the castle of the joyous guard, where they held the queen in safety and all reverence. At last Sir Lancelot desired of King Arthur assurance of liberty for the queen, as also safe conduct for himself and his knights, that he might bring Dame Guinevere with due honor to the king at Carlisle, and thereto the king pledged his word. So Lancelot set forth with the queen, and behind them rode a hundred knights arrayed in green velvet, the housings of the horses of the same all studded with precious stones. Thus they passed through the city of Carlisle, openly, in the sight of all, and there were many who rejoiced that the queen was come again, and Sir Lancelot with her though they of Gawain's party scowled upon them. When they were come into the great hall where Arthur sat, with Sir Gawain and other great lords about him, Sir Lancelot led Guinevere to the throne, and both knelt before the king. Then rising, Sir Lancelot lifted the queen to her feet, and thus he spoke to King Arthur, boldly and well before the whole court. My lord, Sir Arthur, I bring you here your queen, than whom no truer nor nobler lady ever lived, and here stand I, Sir Lancelot du Lac, ready to do battle with any that dare gainsay it. And with these words Sir Lancelot turned and looked upon the lords and knights present in their places, but none would challenge him in that cause, not even Sir Gawain, for he had ever affirmed that Dame Guinevere was a true and honorable lady. Then Sir Lancelot spoke again, now, my lord Arthur, in my own defense, it behooves me to say that never in aught have I been false to you. Peace, said the king to Sir Lancelot, we give you fifteen days in which to leave this kingdom. Then Sir Lancelot sighed heavily and said, Full well I see that nothing availeth me. Then he went to the queen where she sat and said, 
Madam, the time is come when I must leave this fair realm that I have loved. Think well of me, I pray you, and send for me if ever there be aught in which a true knight may serve lady. Therewith he turned him about, and, without greeting to any, passed through the hall, and with his faithful knights rode to the joyous guard, though ever thereafter, in memory of that sad day, he called it the Dolores Guard. In after times, when the king had passed overseas to France, leaving Sir Mordred to rule Britain in his stead, there came messengers from Britain bearing letters for King Arthur, and more evil news than they brought might not well be, for they told how Sir Mordred had usurped his uncle's realm. First he had caused it to be noised abroad that King Arthur was slain in battle with Sir Launcelot, and since there be many ever ready to believe any idle rumor and eager for any change, it had been no hard task for Sir Mordred to call the lords to a parliament and persuade them to make him king. But the queen could not be brought to believe that her lord was dead, so she took refuge in the Tower of London from Sir Mordred's violence, nor was she to be induced to leave her strong refuge for aught that Mordred could promise or threaten. Forthwith King Arthur bade his host make ready to move, and when they had reached the coast, they embarked, and made sail to reach Britain with all possible speed. Sir Mordred, on his part, had heard of their sailing, and hasted to get together a great army. It was grievous to see how many a stout knight, held by Mordred, ay, even many whom Arthur himself had raised to honor and fortune. For it is in the nature of men to be fickle. Thus it was that, when Arthur drew near to Dover, he found Mordred with a mighty host, waiting to oppose his landing. Then there was a great sea-fight, those of Mordred's party going out in boats, to board King Arthur's ships and slay him and his men, or ever they should come to land. Right valiantly did King Arthur bear him, as was his wont, and boldly his followers fought in his cause, so that at last they drove off their enemies and landed at Dover in spite of Mordred and his array. Now by this time many that Mordred had cheated by his lying reports had drawn unto King Arthur, to whom at heart they had ever been loyal, knowing him for a true and noble king, and hating themselves for having been deceived by such a false usurper as Sir Mordred. One night, as King Arthur slept, he thought that Sir Gawain stood before him, looking just as he did in life, and said to him, My uncle and my king, God in his great love has suffered me to come unto you, to warn you that in no wise ye fight on the morrow, for if ye do, ye shall be slain, and with you the most part of the people on both sides. Make ye therefore a treaty. Immediately the king awoke, and called to him the best and wisest of his knights. Then all were agreed that, on any terms whatsoever, a treaty should be made with Sir Mordred, even as Sir Gawain had said and with the dawn messengers went to the camp of the enemy to call Sir Mordred to a conference. So it was determined that the meeting should take place in the sight of both armies, in an open space between the two camps, and that King Arthur and Mordred should each be accompanied by fourteen knights. Little enough faith had either in the other. So when they set forth to the meeting, they bade their hosts join battle if ever they saw a sword drawn. Now as they talked it befell that an adder, coming out of a bush hard by, stung a knight in the foot, and he, seeing the snake, drew his sword to kill it, and thought no harm thereby. But on the instant that the sword flashed, the trumpets blared on both sides, and the two hosts rushed to battle. Never was there fought a fight of such enmity, for brother fought with brother, and comrade with comrade, and fiercely they cut and thrust with many a bitter word between. While King Arthur himself, his heart hot within him, rode through and through the battle, seeking the traitor Mordred. So they fought all day, till at last the evening fell. Then Arthur, looking round him, saw of his valiant knights but two left, Sir Lucan and Sir Bevedere, and these sore wounded, and there over against him, by a great heap of the dead, stood Sir Mordred, the cause of all this ruin. 
Thereupon the king, his heart nigh broken with grief for the loss of his true knights, cried with a loud voice, Traitor, now is thy doom upon thee. And with his spear gripped in both hands, he rushed upon Sir Mordred and smote him that the weapon stood out a fathom behind. And Sir Mordred knew that he had his death wound. With all the might that he had, he thrust up the spear to the haft, and with his sword struck King Arthur upon the head, that the steel pierced the helmet and bit into the head. Then Mordred fell back, stark and dead. Sir Lucan and Sir Bevedere went to the king where he lay, swooning from the blow, and bore him to a little chapel on the seashore. As they laid him on the ground, Sir Lucan fell dead beside the king, and Arthur, coming to himself, found but Sir Bevedere alive beside him. So King Arthur lay wounded to the death, grieving, not that his end was come, but for the desolation of his kingdom and the loss of his good knights. And looking upon the body of Sir Lucan, he sighed and said, Alas, true knight, dead for my sake. If I lived, I should ever grieve for thy death, but now mine own end draws nigh. Then, turning to Sir Bevedere, who stood sorrowing beside him, he said, Leave weeping now, for the time is short and much to do. Hereafter thou shalt weep if thou wilt. But now take my sword Excalibur, hasten to the waterside, and fling it into the deep. Then watch what happens, and bring me word thereof. My lord, said Sir Bevedere, your command shall be obeyed. And taking the sword he departed. But as he went on his way, he looked on the sword, how wondrously it was formed, and the hilt all studded with precious stones, and as he looked he called to mind the marvel by which it had come into the king's keeping. For on a certain day, as Arthur walked on the shore of a great lake, there had appeared above the surface of the water a hand brandishing a sword. On the instant the king had leapt into a boat, and rowing into the lake, had got the sword and brought it back to land. Then he had seen how, on one side the blade, was written, Keep me, but on the other, throw me away. And sore perplexed he had shown it to Merlin, the great wizard, who said, Keep it now, the time for casting away has not yet come. Thinking on this, it seemed to Bevedere that no good but harm must come of obeying the king's word. So, hiding the sword under a tree, he hastened back to the little chapel. Then said the king, what sawest thou? Sir, answered Bevedere, I saw naught but the waves, heard naught but the wind. That is untrue, said King Arthur, I charge thee, as thou art true knight, go again, and spare not to throw away the sword. Sir Bevedere departed a second time, and his mind was to obey his lord, but when he took the sword in his hand, he thought, Sin it is, and shameful, to throw away so glorious a sword. Then, hiding it again, he hastened back to the king. What sawest thou? said King Arthur. Sir, I saw the water lap on the crags. Then spoke the king in great wrath. Traitor and unkind, twice hast thou betrayed me. Art dazzled by the splendor of the jewels? Thou that, till now, hast ever been dear and true to me? Go yet again, but if thou fail me this time, I will arise, and with mine own hands slay thee. Then Sir Bevedere left the king, and that time he took the sword quickly from the place where he had hidden it, and forbearing even to look upon it, he twisted the belt about it, and flung it with all his force into the water. A wondrous sight he saw, for as the sword touched the water, a hand rose from out the deep, caught it, brandished it thrice, and drew it beneath the surface. Sir Bevedere hastened back to the king and told him what he had seen. It is well, said Arthur. Now bear me to the water's edge, and hasten, I pray thee, for I have tarried over long, and my wound has taken cold. So Sir Bevedere raised the king on his back and bore him tenderly to the lonely shore, where the lapping waves floated many an empty helmet and the fitful moonlight fell on the upturned faces of the dead. Scarce had they reached the shore, when there hove in sight a barge, and on its deck stood three tall women, robed all in black and wearing crowns on their heads. 
"'Place me in the barge,' said the king, and softly Sir Bevedere lifted the king into it. And these three queens wept sore over Arthur, and one took his head in her lap and chafed his hands, crying, "'Alas, my brother, thou hast been overlong in coming, and, I fear me, thy wound has taken cold.' Then the barge began to move slowly from the land. When Sir Bevedere saw this, he lifted up his voice and cried with a bitter cry, Ah, my lord Arthur, thou art taken from me, and I, whither shall I go? Comfort thyself, said the king, for in me is no comfort more. I pass to the valley of Avalon, to heal me of my grievous wound. If thou seest me never again, pray for me. So the barge floated away out of sight, and Sir Bevedere stood straining his eyes after it till it had vanished utterly. Then he turned him about and journeyed through the forest until, at daybreak, he reached a hermitage. Entering it, he prayed the holy hermit that he might abide with him, and there he spent the rest of his life in prayer and holy exercise. But of King Arthur is no more known. Some men, indeed, say that he is not dead, but abides in the happy valley of Avalon, until such time as his country's need is sorest, when he shall come again and deliver it. Others say that, of a truth, he is dead, and that in the far west his tomb may be seen, and written on it these words, Here lies Arthur, once king, and king to be. Wow. Is it hard work or what? Being a king, having a kingdom, living in a castle. <laughs> it takes a lot of effort. <laughs> oh dear. And now we have another story. And I'm pretty sure it involves a castle. I don't think it's a castle on the ground. I think it's a castle up in the sky. It's a little bit like Jack and the Beanstalk. It kind of is. This one's Jack the Giant Killer. I'm going to play it. We are coming up to ads, so we will have to interrupt the story. We'll finish it on the other side of the ad break. So here we go. Jack the Giant Killer, my favorite. Jack the Giant Killer. Retold by Joseph Jacobs. In the reign of the famous King Arthur, there lived in Cornwall a lad named Jack who was a boy of a bold temper and took delight in hearing or reading of conjurers, giants, and fairies, and used to listen eagerly to the deeds of the knights of King Arthur's Round Table. In those days there lived on St. Michael's Mount, off Cornwall, a huge giant, eighteen feet high and nine feet round. His fierce and savage looks were the terror of all who beheld him. He dwelt in a gloomy cavern on the top of the mountain, and used to wade over to the mainland in search of prey when he would throw a half a dozen oxen upon his back and tie three times as many sheep and hogs round his waist and march back to his own abode. The giant had done this for many years when Jack resolved to destroy him. Jack took a horn, a shovel, a pickaxe, his armor, and a dark lantern, and one winter's evening he went to the mount. There he dug a pit, twenty-two feet deep and twenty broad, he covered the top over so as to make it look like solid ground. He then blew such a blast on his horn that the giant awoke and came out of his den, crying out, You saucy villain! You shall pay for this! I'll broil you for my breakfast! He had just finished when, taking one step farther, he tumbled headlong into the pit, and Jack struck him a blow on the head with his pickaxe which killed him. Jack then returned home to cheer his friends with the news. Another giant, called Blunderbore, vowed to be revenged on Jack if ever he should have him in his power. This giant kept an enchanted castle in the midst of a lonely wood, and sometime after the death of Cormoran, Jack was passing through a wood, and being weary, sat down and went to sleep. The giant, passing by and seeing Jack, carried him to his castle, where he locked him up in a large room the floor of which was covered with the bodies, skulls, and bones of men and women. Soon after, the giant went to fetch his brother, who was likewise a giant, to take a meal off his flesh. 
and Jack saw with terror through the bars of his prison the two giants approaching. Jack, perceiving in one corner of the room a strong cord, took courage, and making a slip knot at each end, he threw them over their heads and tied it to the window bars. He then pulled till he had choked them. When they were black in the face, he slid down the rope and stabbed them to the heart. Jack next took a great bunch of keys from the pocket of Blunderbore and went into the castle again. He made a strict search through all the rooms, and in one of them found three ladies tied up by the hair of their heads and almost starved to death. They told him that their husbands had been killed by the giants, who had then condemned them to be starved to death. Ladies, said Jack, I have put an end to the monster and his wicked brother, and I give you this castle and all the riches it contains to make some amends for the dreadful pains you have felt. He then, very politely, gave them the keys of the castle and went farther on his journey to Wales. As Jack had but little money, he went on as fast as possible. At length, he came to a handsome house. Jack knocked at the door when there came forth a Welsh giant. Jack said he was a traveler who had lost his way, on which the giant made him welcome and led him into a room where there was a good bed to sleep in. Jack took off his clothes quickly, but though he was weary, he could not go to sleep. Soon after this, he heard the giant walking backward and forward in the next room, saying to himself, Though here you shall lodge with me this night, you shall not see the morning light. My club shall dash your brains out quite. Say you so, thought Jack. Are these your tricks upon travelers? But I hope to prove as cunning as you are. Then, getting out of bed, he groped about the room and at last found a thick log of wood. He laid it in his own place in the bed and then hid himself in a dark corner of the room. The giant, about midnight, entered the apartment and with his bludgeon struck many blows on the bed in the very place where Jack had laid the log. And then he went back to his own room thinking he had broken all Jack's bones. Early in the morning, Jack put a bold face upon the matter and walked into the giant's room to thank him for his lodging. The giant started when he saw him and began to stammer out, Oh, dear me, is it you? Pray, how did you sleep last night? Did you hear or see anything in the dead of the night? Nothing worth speaking of, said Jack carelessly. A rat, I believe, gave me three or four slaps with its tail and disturbed me a little but I soon went to sleep again. The giant wondered more and more at this, yet he did not answer a word, but went to bring two great bowls of hasty pudding for their breakfast. Jack wanted to make the giant believe that he could eat as much as himself, so he contrived to button a leathern bag inside his coat and slip the hasty pudding into this bag while he seemed to put it into his mouth. When breakfast was over, he said to the giant, now I will show you a fine trick. I can cure all wounds with a touch. I could cut off my head in one minute, and the next put it sound again on my shoulders. You shall see an example. He then took hold of the knife, ripped up the leathern bag, and all the hasty pudding tumbled out upon the floor. Odd splutter her nails, cried the Welsh giant, who was ashamed to be outdone by such a little fellow as Jack. Who can do that herself? So he snatched up the knife, plunged it into his own stomach, and in a moment dropped down dead. Jack, having hitherto been successful in all his undertakings, resolved not to be idle in future. He therefore furnished himself with a horse, a cap of knowledge, a sword of sharpness, shoes of swiftness, and an invisible coat, the better to perform the wonderful enterprises that lay before him. He traveled over high hills, and on the third day he came to a large and spacious forest through which his road lay. Scarcely had he entered the forest when he beheld a monstrous giant dragging along by the hair of their heads a handsome knight and his lady. Jack alighted from his horse and tying him to an oak tree put on his invisible coat under which he carried his sword of sharpness. 
When he came up to the giant, he made several strokes at him, but could not reach his body, but wounded his thighs in several places, and at length, putting both hands to his sword and aiming with all his might, he cut off both his legs. Then Jack, setting his foot upon his neck, plunged his sword into the giant's body when the monster gave a groan and expired. The knight and his lady thanked Jack for their deliverance and invited him to their house to receive a proper reward for his services. No, said Jack, I cannot be easy till I find out this monster's habitation. So taking the knight's directions, he mounted his horse and soon after came in sight of another giant who was sitting on a block of timber waiting for his brother's return. Jack alighted from his horse and putting on his invisible coat, approached and aimed a blow at the giant's head, but missing his aim, he only cut off his nose. On this, the giant seized his club and laid about him most unmercifully. Nay, said Jack, if this be the case, I'd better dispatch you. So jumping upon the block, he stabbed him in the back when he dropped down dead. Jack then proceeded on his journey and traveled over hills and dales, till arriving at the foot of a high mountain, he knocked at the door of a lonely house when an old man let him in. When Jack was seated, the hermit thus addressed him. My son, on the top of this mountain is an enchanted castle, kept by the giant Galagantus and a vile magician. I lament the fate of a duke's daughter, whom they seized as she was walking in her father's garden, and brought hither, transformed into a deer. Jack promised that in the morning, at the risk of his life, he would break the enchantment. And after a sound sleep, he rose early, put on his invisible coat, and got ready for the attempt. When he had climbed to the top of the mountain, he saw two fiery griffins, but he passed between them without the least fear of danger, for they could not see him because of his invisible coat. On the castle gate, he found a golden trumpet, under which were written these lines, Whoever can this trumpet blow shall cause the giant's overthrow. As soon as Jack had read this, he seized the trumpet and blew a shrill blast which made the gates fly open and the very castle itself tremble. The giant and the conjurer now knew that their wicked course was at an end, and they stood biting their thumbs and shaking within fear. Jack, with his sword of sharpness, soon killed the giant, and the magician was then carried away by a whirlwind, and every knight and beautiful lady who had been changed into birds and beasts returned to their proper shapes. The castle vanished away like smoke, and the head of the giant Galagantus was sent to King Arthur. The knights and ladies rested that night at the old man's hermitage, and next day they set out for the court. Jack then went up to the king and gave his majesty an account of all his fierce battles. Jack's fame had now spread through the whole country, and at the king's desire, the duke gave him his daughter in marriage to the joy of all his kingdom. After this, the king gave him a large estate on which he and his lady lived the rest of their days in joy and contentment. Wow. Now, have you heard the story, Jack and the Beanstalk? Because that's the same Jack. Now, what do you think of this story, Jack and the Giant Killer? What do you think the difference is there? Well, Jack and the Giant Killer, that's, <laughs> that's got a lot of, <laughs> that's got a lot of blooming violence in it. <laughs> Jack was being a hero in that. He was defending the village, wasn't he? What about in Jack and the Beanstalk? Because the stories I saw at the kindergartens, at the preschools. Jack was just a naughty little boy bothering this giant who lived up in the clouds. But in this story, the giants were naughty. And Jack was a hero. So boy, oh boy, it's tough work being a hero. Let's play a little song. Bye. 
Five little dragons went out to play over the hills and far away. Mother dragon said, "It's time for your snack," but only four little dragons came back. Four little dragons went out to play over the hills and far away. Mother dragon said, "It's time for your snack." But only three little dragons came back. Three little dragons went out to play over the hills and far away. Mother dragon said, "It's time for your snack." But only two little dragons came back. Two little dragons went out to play over the hills and far away. Mother dragon said, "It's time for your snack." But only one little dragon came back. One little dragon went out to play over the hills and far away. Mother dragon said, "It's time for your snack." But none of the five little dragons came back. Worried mother dragon began to breathe fire, but the tears she shed made the fire expire. Mother dragon said, "It's a really good snack," and all of the five little dragons came back. Let's go to the market. Let's go to the store. We can buy a loaf of bread and maybe a few things more. Let's go to the market. Let's go to the store. We can buy some broccoli and maybe a few things more. Let's go to the market. Let's go to the store. We can buy some cereal and maybe a few things more. Let's go to the market. Let's go to the store. We can buy some bananas and maybe a few things more. Let's go to the market. Let's go to the store. We can buy some orange juice and maybe a few things more. Now it's time for another story. It's time for the adventures of Maya the bee. We are now up to chapter nine, so here it is, chapter nine: the adventures of Maya the bee, the lost leg. Chapter nine of the adventures of Maya the bee, by Voldemar Bonsells. Chapter nine: the lost leg. Near the hole where Maya had set herself up for the summer lived a family of bark-boring beetles. Friedelin, the father, was an earnest, industrious man who wanted many children and took immense pains to bring up a large family. He had done very well. He had fifty energetic sons to fill him with pride and high hopes. Each had dug his own meandering little tunnel in the bark of the pine tree. And all were getting on and were comfortably settled. My wife, Friedelin said to Maya after they had known each other some time, has arranged things so that none of my sons interferes with the others. They are not even acquainted. Each goes his own way. Maya knew that human beings were none too fond of Friedelin and his people, though she herself liked him and liked his opinions and had found no reason to avoid him. In the morning, before the sun arose and the woods were still asleep, she could hear his fine tapping and boring. It sounded like a delicate trickling, or as if the tree were breathing in its sleep. Later, she would see the thin brown dust that he had emptied out of his corridor. Once he came at an early hour, as he often did, to wish her good morning and ask if she had slept well. Not flying today, he inquired. No, it's too windy. It was windy. The wind rushed and roared and flung the branches into a mad tumult. 
the leaves looked ready to fly away. After each great gust, the sky would brighten, and in the pale light the trees seemed balder. The pine, in which Maya and Fridolin lived, shrieked with the voices of the wind, as in a fury of anger and excitement. Fridolin sighed. "'I worked all night,' he told Maya, "'all night. But what can you do? You've got to do something to get somewhere, and I'm not altogether satisfied with this pine. I should have tackled a fir tree.' He wiped his brow and smiled in self-pity. "'How are your children?' asked Maya pleasantly. "'Thank you,' said Fridolin. "'Thank you for your interest. But—' he hesitated. "'But I don't supervise the way I used to. Still, I have reason to believe they are all doing well.' As he sat there, a little brown man with slightly curtailed wing sheaths, and a breastplate that looked like a head too large for its body, Maya thought he was almost comical. But she knew he was a dangerous beetle, who could do immense harm to the mighty trees of the forest, and if his tribe attacked a tree in numbers, then the green needles were doomed. The tree would turn sear and die. It was utterly without defenses against the little marauders, who destroyed the bark and the sapwood. And the sapwood is necessary to the life of a tree, because it carries the sap up to the very tips of the branches. There were stories of how whole forests had fallen victims to the race of boring beetles. Maya looked at Fridolin reflectively. She was awed into solemnity at the thought of the great power these little creatures possessed, and of how important they could become. Fridolin sighed and said in a worried tone, "'Ah, life would be beautiful if there were no woodpeckers.' Maya nodded. "'Yes, indeed, you're right. The woodpecker gobbles up every insect he sees.' "'If it were only that,' observed Fridolin, "'if it were only that he got the careless people who fool around on the outside, on the bark, I'd say very well, a woodpecker must live too. But it seems all wrong that the bird should follow us right into our corridors, into the remotest corners of our homes.' "'But he can't. He's too big, isn't he?' Friedlin looked at Maya with an air of grave importance, lifting his brow and shaking his head two or three times. It seemed to please him that he knew something she didn't know. "'Too big? What difference does his size make? No, my dear, it's not his size we are afraid of. It's his tongue.' Maya made big eyes. Friedlin told her about the woodpecker's tongue— that it was long and thin and round as a worm and barbed and sticky. "'He can stretch his tongue out ten times my length,' cried the bark beetle, flourishing his arm. "'You think, now, now, he has reached the limit. He can't make it the tiniest bit longer. But no, he goes on stretching and stretching it. He pokes it deep into the cracks and crevices of the bark, on the chance that he'll find somebody sitting there. He even pushes it into our passageways.' "'actually into our corridors and chambers. "'Things stick to it, and that's the way he pulls us out of our homes.' "'I'm not a coward,' said Maya. "'I don't think I am, but what you say makes me creepy.' "'Oh, you're all right,' said Friedolin, a little envious. "'You with your sting are safe. "'A person will think twice before he'll let you sting his tongue. "'Anybody will tell you that. "'But how about us bark beetles?' How do you think we feel? A cousin of mine got caught. We had just had a little quarrel on account of my wife. I remember every detail perfectly. My cousin was paying us a visit and hadn't yet got used to our ways or our arrangements. All of a sudden we heard a woodpecker scratching and boring, one of the smaller species. It must have begun right at our building, because as a rule we hear him beforehand and have time to run to shelter before he reaches us. Suddenly I heard my poor cousin scream in the dark, Friedolin, I'm sticking! Then all I heard was a short, desperate scuffle, followed by complete silence, and in a few moments the woodpecker was hammering at the house next door. My poor cousin. Her name was Agatha. Feel how my heart is beating, said Maya in a whisper. You oughtn't to have told it so quickly. My goodness, the things that do happen— and the little bee thought of her own adventures in the past and the accidents that might still happen to her. 
A laugh from Fridolin interrupted her reflections. She looked up in surprise. "'See who's coming!' he cried. "'Coming up the tree. "'Here's the fellow for you. "'I tell you, he's a... "'But you'll see.' Maya followed the direction of his gaze and saw a remarkable animal slowly climbing up the trunk. She wouldn't have believed such a creature was possible if she had not seen it with her own eyes. "'Hadn't we better hide?' she asked, alarm getting the better of astonishment. "'Absurd,' replied the bark-beetle. "'Just sit still and be polite to the gentleman. He is very learned, really, very scholarly, and what is more, kind and modest. Like most persons of his type, rather funny. See what he's doing now.' "'Probably thinking,' observed Maya, who couldn't get over her astonishment. "'He's struggling against the wind,' said Fridolin, and laughed. "'I hope his legs don't get entangled.' "'Are those long threads really his legs?' asked Maya, opening her eyes wide. "'I've never seen the like.' Meanwhile, the newcomer had drawn near, and Maya got a better view of him. He looked as though he were swinging in the air. His rotund little body hung so high on his monstrously long legs, which groped for a footing on all sides like a movable scaffolding of threads. He stepped along cautiously, feeling his way. The little brown sphere of his body rose and sank, rose and sank. His legs were so very long and thin that one alone would certainly not have been enough to support his body. He needed all at once, unquestionably. As they were jointed in the middle, they rose high in the air above him. Maya clapped her hands together. "'Well,' she cried, "'did you ever! Would you have dreamed that such delicate legs, legs as fine as a hair, could be so nimble and useful, that one could really use them, and they'd know what to do? Friedelin, I think it's wonderful, simply wonderful!' "'Ah, bah!' said the bark beetle. "'Don't take things so seriously. "'Just laugh when you see something funny, that's all.' "'But I don't feel like laughing. "'Often we laugh at something and later find out "'it was just because we haven't understood.' "'By this time the stranger had joined them "'and was looking down at Maya "'from the height of his pointed triangles of legs. "'Good morning,' he said. "'A real windstorm!' A pretty strong draft, don't you think? Or, no, you're of a different opinion? He clung to the tree as hard as he could. Friedelin turned to hide his laughing, but little Maya replied politely that she quite agreed with him, and that was why she had not gone out flying. Then she introduced herself. The stranger squinted down at her through his legs. Maya of the Nation of Bees, he repeated. "'Delighted, really. I have heard a great deal about bees. I, myself, belong to the general family of spiders, species Daddy Longlegs, and my name is Hannibal.' The word spider has an evil sound in the ears of all smaller insects, and Maya could not quite conceal her fright, especially as she was reminded of her agony in Thecla's web. Hannibal seemed to take no notice, so Maya decided— "'Well, if need be, I'll fly away, and he can whistle for me. "'He has no wings, and his web is somewhere else.' "'I am thinking,' said Hannibal, "'thinking very hard. "'If you will permit me, I will come a little closer. "'That big branch there makes a good shield against the wind.' "'Why, certainly,' said Maya, making room for him. "'Friedelin said good-bye and left.' Maya stayed. She was eager to get at Hannibal's personality. "'The many, many different kinds of animals there are in the world,' she thought. "'Every day a fresh discovery.' The wind had subsided some, and the sun shone through the branches. From below rose the song of a robin redbreast, filling the woods with joy. Maya could see it perched on a branch, could see its throat swell, and pulse with the song as it held its little head raised up to the light. "'If only I could sing like that robin redbreast,' she said, "'I'd perch on a flower and keep it up the live-long day.' 
"'You'd produce something lovely, you would, with your humming and buzzing. "'The bird looks so happy.' "'You have great fancies,' said the daddy longlegs. "'Supposing every animal were to wish he could do something that nature had not fitted him to do, "'the world would be all topsy-turvy. "'Supposing a robin redbreast thought he had to have a sting, a sting above everything else, "'or a goat wanted to fly about gathering honey.' "'Supposing a frog were to come along and languish for my kind of legs?' "'Maya laughed. "'That isn't just what I mean. "'I mean, it seems lovely to be able to make all beings as happy as the bird does with his song. "'But goodness gracious!' she exclaimed suddenly. "'Mr. Hannibal, you have one leg too many!' "'Hannibal frowned and looked into space, vexed. "'Well, you've noticed it.' he said glumly. But as a matter of fact, one leg too few, not too many. Why do you usually have eight legs? Permit me to explain. We spiders have eight legs. We need them all. Besides, eight is a more aristocratic number. One of my legs got lost. Too bad about it. However you manage, you make the best of it. "'It must be dreadfully disagreeable to lose a leg,' Maya sympathized. Hannibal propped his chin on his hand and arranged his legs to keep them from being easily counted. "'I'll tell you how it happened. Of course, as usual, when there's mischief, a human being is mixed up in it. We spiders are careful, and look what we're doing, but human beings are careless. They grab you sometimes as though you were a piece of wood. Shall I tell you?' "'Oh, yes, please,' said Maya, settling herself comfortably. "'It would be awfully interesting. "'You must certainly have gone through a great deal.' "'I should say so,' said Hannibal. "'Now listen. "'We Daddy Longlegs, you know, hunt by night. "'I was then living in a green garden house. "'It was overgrown with ivy, "'and there were a number of broken window panes.' which made it very convenient for me to crawl in and out. The man came at dark. In one hand he carried his artificial sun, which he calls lamp. In the other hand a small bottle, under his arm some paper, and in his pocket another bottle. He put everything down on the table and began to think, because he wanted to write his thoughts on the paper. You must certainly have come across paper in the woods or in the garden, the black on the paper is what man has excogitated, excogitated. Marvelous, cried Maya, all aglow, that she was to learn so much. For this purpose, Hannibal continued, man needs both bottles. He inserts a stick into the one and drinks out of the other. The more he drinks, the better it goes. Of course, it is about us insects that he writes. Everything he knows about us, and he writes strenuously, but the result is not much to boast of, because up to now man has found out very little in regard to insects. He is absolutely ignorant of our soul life, and hasn't the least consideration of our feelings. You will see. Don't you think well of human beings? asked Maya. Oh, yes, yes, but the loss of a leg— the daddy longlegs looked down slantwise, is apt to embitter one, rather. "'I see,' said Maya. "'One evening I was sitting on a window-frame, as usual, prepared for the chase, and the man was sitting at the table, his two bottles before him, trying to produce something. It annoyed me dreadfully that a whole swarm of little flies and gnats, upon which I depend for my sustenance, had settled upon the artificial sun, and were staring into it in that crude, stupid, uneducated way of theirs. Well, observed Maya, I think I'd look at a thing like that myself. Look, for all I care, but to look and to stare like an idiot are two extremely different things. Just watch once and see the silly jig they dance around a lamp. It's nothing for them to butt their heads about twenty times— 
Some of them keep it up until they burn their wings, and all the time they stare and stare at the light. Poor creatures! Evidently they lose their wits. Then they had better stay outside on the window frame or under the leaves. They're safe from the lamp there, and that's where I can catch them. Well, on that fateful night, I saw from my position on the window frame that some gnats were lying scattered on the table beside the lamp, drawing their last breath. The man did not seem to notice or care about them, so I decided to go and take them myself. That's perfectly natural, isn't it? Perfectly. And yet it was my undoing. I crept up the leg of the table very softly on my guard, until I could peep over the edge. The man seemed dreadfully big. I watched him working, then slowly, very slowly, carefully lifting one leg at a time, I crossed over to the lamp. As long as I was covered by the bottle, all went well, but I had scarcely turned the corner when the man looked up and grabbed me. He lifted me up by one of my legs, dangled me in front of his huge eyes, and said, "'See what's here! Just see what's here!' and he grinned the brute. He grinned with his whole face as though it were a laughing matter. Hannibal sighed, and little Maya kept quite still. Her head was in a whirl. "'Have human beings such immense eyes?' she asked at last. "'Please think of me in the position I was in,' cried Hannibal, vexed. "'Try to imagine how I felt.' Who'd like to be hanging by the leg in front of eyes twenty times as big as his own body, and a mouth full of gleaming teeth, each fully twice as big as himself? Well, what do you think? Awful, perfectly awful. Thank the Lord my leg broke off. There's no telling what might have happened if my leg had not broken off. I fell to the table, and then I ran. I ran as fast as my remaining legs would take me, and hid behind the bottle. There I stood, and hurled threats of violence at the man. They saved me, my threats did. The man was afraid to run after me. I saw him lay my leg on the white paper, and I watched how it wanted to escape, which it can't do without me. Was it still moving? asked Maya, prickling at the thought. Yes, our legs always do move when they're pulled out. My leg ran, but I not being there it didn't know where to run to, so it merely flopped about aimlessly on the same spot, and the man watched it, clutching at his nose and smiling, smiling, the heartless wretch, at my leg's sense of duty. Impossible, said the little bee, quite scared. An often leg can't crawl. An often leg? What is an often leg? A leg that has come off, explained Maya, staring at him. Don't you know? At home we children used the word often for anything that had come off. You should drop your nursery slang when you're out in the world and in the presence of cultured people, said Hannibal severely. But it is true that our legs totter along after they have been torn from our bodies. I can't believe it without proof. Do you think I'll tear one of my legs off to satisfy you? Hannibal's tone was ugly. I see you're not a fit person to associate with. Nobody, I'd like you to know, nobody has ever doubted my word before. Maya was terribly put out. She couldn't understand what had upset the daddy long legs so, or what dreadful thing she had done. It isn't altogether easy to get along with strangers, she thought. They don't think the way we do, and don't see that we mean no harm. She was depressed and cast a troubled look at the spider with his long legs and soured expression. Really, someone ought to come and eat you up. Hannibal had evidently mistaken Maya's good nature for weakness, for now something unusual happened to the little bee. Suddenly her depression passed and gave way, not to alarm or timidity, but to a calm courage. She straightened up, lifted her lovely transparent wings, uttered her high, clear buzz, 
and said with a gleam in her voice, "'I'm a bee, Mr. Hannibal.' "'I beg your pardon,' said he, and without saying good-bye, turned and ran down the tree-trunk as fast as a person can run who has seven legs. Maya had to laugh willy-nilly. From down below, Hannibal began to scold. "'You're bad. You threaten helpless people. You threaten them with your sting when you know they're handicapped by a misfortune and can't get away fast. But your hour is coming, and when you're in a tight place, you'll think of me and be sorry.' Hannibal disappeared under the leaves of the colt's foot on the ground. His last words had not reached the little bee. The wind had almost died away, and the day promised to be fine. White clouds sailed aloft in a deep, deep blue, looking happy and serene like good thoughts of the Lord. Maya was cheered. She thought of the rich shaded meadows by the woods, and of the sunny slopes beyond the lake. A blithe activity, must have begun there by this time. In her mind, she saw the slim grasses waving, and the purple iris that grew in the rills at the edge of the woods. From the flower of an iris, she could look across to the mysterious night of the pine forest, and catch its cool breath of melancholy. She knew that its forbidding silence, which transformed the sunshine into a reddish half-light of sleep, was the home of the fairy tale. Maya was already flying— she had started off instinctively, in answer to the call of the meadows and their gay carpeting of flowers. It was a joy to be alive. End of chapter 9「Oh, where am I? Where do you think I am?" I'm in a forest. Can you hear that bird? Do you know which bird that is? It's a bluebird. <laughs> and bluebirds live in America for a start. I've never seen a bluebird before, but here I am now. And they are beautiful. What do they, what do they look like, you ask? Great question, let me tell you. This bird has a round belly, long wings, short legs. Its black bill is short and straight. Male eastern bluebirds are easily identified by their bright blue heads and wings. Females sport duller colors with grayish heads and backs and bluish wings. Both males and females have a rust-colored throat and white stomachs. Probably the prettiest bird out there. What do they eat? Great question. I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> More than half of an eastern blue bluebird's diet consists of beetles, crickets, grasshoppers, and caterpillars. Nom, 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 nom. When the weather is cooler and the insects are scarce, it'll also eat fruits and berries. I love fruits and berries. What eats them? Oh my gosh, I can't believe you asked that question. Well, surely someone's going to eat them. Something out there is going to eat a bluebird. Let's find out. Snakes. Cats. Black bears. Raccoons and other birds such as house sparrows hunt adult and baby eastern bluebirds. I can't believe this. I, I, I can't believe that a black bear could catch a bluebird. I can't believe that a cute little sparrow would eat a bluebird. I can't believe it. Eastern chipmunks and flying squirrels like to eat eastern bluebird eggs. At least that's a little more ethical. <laughs> How do they behave, you ask? Great question, let me tell you. These birds are skilled flyers with incredible vision. They can spot an insect on the ground from 60 feet away. Eastern bluebirds often sing. Oh. 
<laughs> like that. <laughs> Using their voices to stay in touch with flock members. They also use vocalizations to warn predators to stay away from their small cup-like nests that are usually built inside all old woodpecker holes. And that's their castle. Eastern bluebird eggs are pale blue. Most fledglings or baby birds leave the nest about three weeks after they hatch, but some stay to help their parents with the next batch of eggs. And that provides a lot of protection and peace for their family, which is why I associate bluebirds with the castle. We've just got time for a little story here. And this is about Peter Rabbit learning about something that he hadn't guessed about the bluebird and the robin. Peter learned something he hadn't guessed. The bluebird and the robin. Running over to the old orchard very early in the morning for a little gossip with Jenny Wren and his other friends there had become a regular thing with Peter Rabbit. He was learning a great many things, and some of them were most surprising. Now, two of Peter's oldest and best friends in the old orchard were Winsome Bluebird and Welcome Robin. Every spring they arrived pretty nearly together, though Winsome Bluebird usually was a few days ahead of Welcome Robin. This year, Winsome had arrived while the snow still lingered in patches. He was, as he always is, the herald of sweet Mistress Spring, and when Peter had heard for the first time Winsome's soft, sweet whistle, which seemed to come from nowhere in particular and from everywhere in general, he had kicked up his long hind legs from pure joy. Then, when a few days later he had heard Welcome Robin's joyous message of chirrup, 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 chirp, from the tip-top of a tall tree, he had known that Mr. Spring really had arrived. Peter loves Winsome Bluebird and Welcome Robin just as everybody else does, and he had known them so long and so well that he thought he knew all there was to know about them. He would have been very indignant had anybody told him he didn't. "'Those cousins don't look much alike, do they?' remarked Jenny Wren as she poked her head out of her house to gossip with Peter. "'What cousins?' demanded Peter, staring very hard in the direction in which Jenny Wren was looking. "'Those two sitting on the fence over there. Where are your eyes, Peter?' replied Jenny rather sharply. Peter stared harder than ever. On one post sat Winsome Bluebird, and on another post sat Welcome Robin. I don't see anybody but Winsome and Welcome, and they are not even related, replied Peter with a little puzzled frown. Tut, 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 Peter, exclaimed Jenny Wren. Tut, 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 tut. Who told you any such nonsense as that? Of course they are related. They are cousins. I thought everybody knew that. They belong to the same family that Melody the Thrush and all the other thrushes belong to. That makes them all cousins. What? exclaimed Peter, looking as if he didn't believe a word of what Jenny Wren had said. Jenny repeated, and still Peter looked doubtful. Then Jenny lost her temper, a thing she does very easily. If you don't believe me, go ask one of them, she snapped, and disappeared inside her house, where Peter could hear her scolding away to herself. The more he thought of it, the more this struck Peter as good advice. So he hopped over to the foot of the fence post on which Winsome Bluebird was sitting. Jenny Wren says that you and Welcome Robin are cousins. She doesn't know what she is talking about, does she? asked Peter. Winsome chuckled. It was a soft, gentle chuckle. <laughs> yes, said he, nodding his head. We are. You can trust that little busybody to know what she is talking about every time. I sometimes think she knows more about other people's affairs than about her own. Welcome and I may not look much alike, but we are cousins just the same. 
Don't you think Welcome is looking unusually fine this spring? Not a bit finer than you are yourself, Winsome, replied Peter politely. I just love that sky-blue coat of yours. What is the reason that Mrs. Bluebird doesn't wear as bright a coat as you do? <laughs> Go ask Jenny Wren, chuckled Winsome Bluebird. And before Peter could say another word, he flew over to the roof of Farmer Brown's house. Back scampered Peter to tell Jenny Wren that he was sorry he had doubted her and that he never would again. Then he begged Jenny to tell him why it was that Mrs. Bluebird was not as brightly dressed as was Winsome. Mrs. Bluebird, like most mothers, is altogether too busy to spend much time taking care of her clothes, and fine clothes need a lot of care, replied Jenny. Besides, when Winsome is about, he attracts all the attention, and that gives her a chance to slip in and out of her nest without being noticed. I don't believe you know, Peter Rabbit, where Winsome's nest is. Peter had to admit that he didn't although he had tried his best to find out by watching Winsome. "'I think it's over in that little house put up by Farmer Brown's boy,' he ventured. "'I saw both Mr. and Mrs. Bluebird go in it when they first came, and I've seen Winsome around it a great deal since. So I guess it is there.' "'So you guess it is there,' mimicked Jenny Wren. "'Well, your guess is quite wrong, Peter.' quite wrong. As a matter of fact, it is in one of those old fence posts. But just which one I am not going to tell you. I will leave that for you to find out. Mrs. Bluebird certainly shows good sense. She knows a good house when she sees it. The hole in that post is one of the best holes anywhere around here. If I had arrived here early enough, I would have taken it myself. But... Mrs. Bluebird already had her nest built in it and four eggs there, so there was nothing for me to do but come here. Just between you and me, Peter, I think the Bluebirds show more sense in nest building than do their cousins the Robins. There is nothing like a house with stout walls and a doorway just big enough to get in and out of comfortably. Peter nodded, quite as if he understood all about the advantages of a house with walls. "'That reminds me,' said he. "'The other day I saw Welcome Robin getting mud and carrying it away. Pretty soon he was joined by Mrs. Robin, and she did the same thing. They kept it up till I got tired of watching them. What were they doing with that mud?' "'Building their nest, of course, stupid,' retorted Jenny." Welcome Robin, with that black head, beautiful russet breast, black and white throat, and yellow bill, not to mention the proud way in which he carries himself, certainly is a handsome fellow, and Mrs. Robin is only a little less handsome. How they can be content to build that kind of a home they do is more than I can understand. People think that Mr. Wren and I use a lot of trash in our nest. Perhaps we do. But I can tell you one thing, and that is, it is clean trash. It is just sticks and clean straws, and before I lay my eggs I see to it that my nest is lined with feathers. More than this, there isn't any cleaner housekeeper than I am, if I do say it. Welcome Robin is a fine looker and a fine singer, and everybody loves him. But when it comes to housekeeping, he and Mrs. Robin are just plain dirty. They make the foundation of their nest of mud. Plain, common, ordinary mud. They cover this with dead grass, and sometimes there's mighty little of this over the inside walls of mud. I know because I've seen the inside of their nest often. Anybody with any eyes at all can find their nest. More than once I've known them to have their nest washed away in a heavy rain or have it blown down in a high wind. Nothing like that ever happens to Winsome Bluebird or to me. Jenny disappeared inside her house, and Peter waited for her to come out again. Welcome Robin flew down on the ground, ran a few steps, and then stood still with his head on one side as if listening. Then he reached down and tugged at something, and presently, out of the ground, came a long, wriggling angleworm. 
Welcome gulped it down and ran on a few steps, then once more paused to listen. This time he turned and ran three or four steps to the right, where he pulled another worm out of the ground. He acts as if he heard those worms in the ground, said Peter, speaking aloud without thinking. He does, said Jenny Wren, poking her head out of her doorway just as Peter spoke. How do you suppose he would find them when they are in the ground if he didn't hear them? Can you hear them? asked Peter. I never tried, and I don't intend to waste my time trying, retorted Jenny. Welcome Robin may enjoy eating them, but for my part I want something smaller and daintier. Young grasshoppers, tender young beetles, small caterpillars, bugs, and spiders. Peter had to turn his head aside to hide the wry face he had just had to make at the mention of such things as food. Is that all welcome Robin eats? he asked innocently. <laughs> I should say not, laughed Jenny. He eats a lot of other kinds of worms, and he just dearly loves fruit like strawberries and cherries, and all sorts of small berries. Well, I can't stop here talking any longer. I'm going to tell you a secret, Peter, if you'll promise not to tell. Of course Peter promised, and Jenny leaned so far down that Peter wondered how she could keep from falling, as she whispered. I've got seven eggs in my nest, so if you don't see much of me for the next week or more, you'll know why. I've just got to sit on those eggs and keep them warm. Well, we're coming up to the end of another show. We've got about one minute to do a quick little cheeky activity. <laughs> just going to be still, as still as possible, still like a castle, with the sound of bluebirds in the background. Okay, on the count of three, I'm going to press pause on the music, and we're going to be just completely still, and only focusing on our breathing. Okay, are you ready? One. Two, we're gonna be completely still, not even moving one little bit, like a statue. One, two, three. Were you still? Okay, one more time. One, two, three. Oh, and that's all we got time for. Thanks so much for tuning in. And we'll see you next week at the Secret Kindergarten, the best radio show on planet Earth for young children here on Revolution Radio. We'll see you at the next one. <laughs>